At Fibre Arts Take Two, we love a good collaboration. So how could we go past the wonderful work of Ava Roth? Ava is a Toronto-based encaustic painter, embroiderer and mixed media artist. Fundamentally guided and inspired by organic and local materials, relying on Canadian beeswax, foraged wood, birch bark, foliage and horsehair to create her works. As an encaustic artist, the common thread throughout Abba's beautiful mixed media artwork has been Canadian beeswax for over a decade. Ava is currently absorbed in an interspecies art collaboration with local honeybees. This project, like all Ava's work, explores the boundaries of where humans collide with the natural environment and imagines a more beautiful outcome for our encounter. Anyone who has ever worked with bees or is a beekeeper can instantly appreciate how much trial and error Ava must have endured when deciding to combine creative forces with these remarkable insects. It's easy to become impatient when creating, but like the seasons in life, there are ebbs and flows, and Ava has learnt to appreciate being able to slow down, taking her time to create a masterpiece. This is evident not only in her Honeycomb collection series, but also in the stunning mural she has created in her home. Inspired by the Royal Palace in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, Ava recreated her version of a rich textured wallpaper with her own tapestry of gold paint, taking over 12 months to complete. When waiting for the seasons to change, Ava is developing a collection of encaustic sewn paintings, encaustic embroideries and encaustic works on paper. Combining techniques from both fine art and crafts, these collections also use natural materials and processes to explore the intersection between human beings and the natural world. Ava is represented by Wall Space Gallery in Ottawa. In addition to exhibiting in both solo and group shows, her work has been featured in a multitude of online and print magazines, and her pieces have been acquired by private collectors throughout Canada and internationally. As a fellow beekeeper and encaustic enthusiast, I'm really looking forward to chatting with Ava today. So please join me in welcoming Ava Roth. Hi, Ava. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was really beautiful. I've never seen everything put together in that kind of way. It's oh. really Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I, I, I love doing those for people. I think it's really beautiful and um, doing the research and reading all your past interviews and you've had a lot of press exposure. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it's been, it's interesting to see what sort of grabs people's um, imaginations and the, the bee collaboration certainly has. And so most of the press recently has been around that. Yeah, 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 I noticed that. And even an Australian publication, um, the Frankie magazine. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I mean, that's, I guess that's just how it works now that, you know, things just go all over the place really quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, I've never had the kind of attention for my work before the Beat collaboration, but it seems to really inspire people, um, you know, partly in the environmental world, in the art world. Um, it, it's, I think that it, it touches on a lot of different universes of interest. Yeah, certainly does. It's like, um, do you ever feel like with the Bee collaboration, like that's, that's you know, that's that's obviously captured people's hearts and attention and it's like oh wow you know that's what people focus on it's like when an actor does like an award-winning <laughs> film and yeah. they've emerged and nobody sees the years behind the scenes of right. you know, the training and this and all the other work and all the other films and yeah um, um, no, no, who are actors who feel that way I mean I don't I don't think I'm getting the kind of attention that would would you know put me in a place to find it tedious so no <laughs> but I know what you mean well, yeah, you're certainly famous in our little bubble then. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have some wonderful people watching and I'd like to invite everybody, if you'd like to, to make a comment and say hello to Ava um, and also ask a question, please feel free. That's why we, we run these things live. Um, it's not because we love the stress of it. It's because we really want people to engage and, um, yeah, have a join the conversation as well. So. Yeah. yeah. 
So we've got Rita with us. Hi, Rita from Tasmania. Yeah. Wow. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Have it. Yes, I agree. Um, your encaustic work's just beautiful. It Thank really you. is beautiful. But yeah. I thought we might start because it's also beautiful and so prominent behind you there is your gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous mural. Um, thank you. It's my dining room. We we um, we live in a very old house. It's over 125 years old. Um, and uh, uh, this was really a labor of love to take over this this old room that had been neglected and to to bring it to life and sort of make it uh, make it my own. Yeah, uh, people have, have already noticed. So, hi, Kristen. Kristen. Uh, gold painted wall is stunning. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, hello. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> and Janet from the Midwest. Hi, Janet. Yeah. It's lovely to see you again. And Julie from the Gold Coast. Love your work. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. This is really, this is really touching. Yeah, you get to feel a lot of love from all over the world. It's beautiful. Yeah, it really is all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Patricia, our beautiful friend, um, she usually watches, but she she can't stay. She has a previous engagement, but she'll catch up later. Oh, it's going to be a good one, Trish, Patricia. Um, I just want to show people some of more of your your mural behind you. Um, mm -hmm. oh, I call it a mural. You call it a, a, a painted room. Yeah, so. I mean, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at this. This is not a small room, is it? This is a large no, it's room. Really, it's really long. It's a long room, and it's interrupted by a lot of different space, different like doors and windows. And um, uh, yeah, it was it was really one of the more fun projects of my life. Actually, um, it took me a long time. I decided to. Um, to not take any time out of my work day to do it, um, but just to do it at night after my kids went to sleep. And so it took me a long time. It took me a year. Um, and I just started with a little paintbrush. I mean, it's just like, essentially it's a freehand doodle um, in paint. And I, so I just started in one corner and it was really meditative. And I just eventually worked my way around the whole room. It's gorgeous. It's so whimsical as well. Like, I just noticed up in this one here, like the little uh, child on the tire swing. And yeah, the there were a lot of different things. And like my kids would would like would ask me to add certain things in. So like my son's middle name is Wolf and there's a wolf. And, you know, somebody would ask me for a spider or a bear. And so there are lots of little things. Um, actually, I should mention that that the um, the inspiration for this um, uh, was the palace in Cambodia, but also there's um, a Scandinavian artist whose name I can't pronounce, but I can spell his last name. It's B-O-O-N-T-J-E um, maybe. And his first name is Tord, T-O-R-D. Um, and he, he does like a similar sort of like very whimsical, um, playful play on foliage, flora and fauna. And um, I was really into his design work for a while and so um use that as a as a platform yeah well it's it's certainly beautiful but you mentioned that you're going to move house yeah <laughs> yeah how are you going to leave that behind you can't leave that it's behind. funny everybody asks me that and I mean, yeah. I don't know if other if other artists feel this way but I feel like I really like I really like leaving my stuff behind. I like giving my stuff away. I like selling my stuff. I like bartering my stuff. I just, I don't like to hang on to it. It feels, um, it feels nice for me to move on. Um, and uh, I'll do something else in, in our new house. Um, but it's not, it's not hard for me to leave it. It's kind of the opposite. There's something kind of exhilarating about, about leaving it. I mean, and I, I really do um, deeply feel connected to the process of making things. And so at some level, um, being attached to the result, it's it's not, I, I don't wanna say I don't care what what it looks like, but, um, but for me, like the deep love is with the process of making it. Um, and I had that experience in this room, so that's it. Yeah, and you've got some beautiful photographs of it and some memories and- yeah. 
Yeah, I think the photographs are nicer than the, re than the reality of it. So I'm very pleased with the photographs. Yeah. yeah. I remember when we sold our house uh, a few couple of years ago now, one of the hardest things for me to leave behind was, I don't know if you do it in Canada, but you know when your children are growing and you mark on the wall or, yeah, or the... Of course. That yeah. was the hardest thing to, I think, leave. Like I wanted to pull that panel off and take it with us, but I right. didn't. Um, just took a photo, but yeah, that was tough for me. Yeah, that would, be, that would be hard. That would be a different kind of hard for sure. Yeah. yeah, but I thought because of the, you know, the the interaction you had with your children during that time, and like wolves on the wall, and the yeah, yeah. It might be kind of a similar feeling. But um, that's good. That's good that you can let go. And I feel like if you yeah. can let go of the past, it just makes so much more room for new things to come in. It does. Yeah. 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 So, Ava, for people who aren't familiar with your background and how you, you became, well, an encaustic artist, can you describe a little bit about your background and um, how you fell in love with, with beeswax? Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess there, there are lots of different ways of answering that question. I mean, I think, um, you know, my, my journey to beeswax was not direct. I think that as a young person, I was really interested in just making, just making as many things as I could. And I didn't really have a clear direction. I didn't have a clear sense of what it is that I wanted to make. And actually, this is something that I think about a lot. I found that really confusing as a young person, because I think that there's this idea that an artist is supposed to be, um, is supposed to know what their expression is, what it is that they're trying to express, right? Like that there's this irrepressible need to, ex to get something outside from inside of you. And that's the definition of an artist that we sort of have. Um, and that wasn't my experience. My experience was wanting to make stuff, but not really knowing uh, what I wanted to make. Um, and that was really confusing for a long time. So I tried all kinds of thing, things. I just made everything, basically. Um, I spent like long periods of time doing, you know, embroidery or, or um, uh, gouache or, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. I, I book binding, everything that I could get my hands on, essentially. Um, and uh, it made me, I think, feel like I wasn't an artist because I didn't know what that, that, thing was that I was, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I didn't know what it, what it was that I was doing with all of that information. Um, yeah. And then it was actually through beeswax that that started to really shift. So maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, 15 years ago, I discovered encaustic. Um, and I think it wasn't just the beeswax, it was probably just the moment in my life where I had been doing things for long enough that things started to take, everything that I was doing started to take some kind of shape. Um, but it, at that time I encountered beeswax and I mean, it was so beautiful and it connected to so many things that I loved and, and, um, and it became a medium that I was working in through which a lot of things started to make sense. Um, and then at this point, I think, um, I think that that idea that we have of what an artist is, is sort of backwards, actually. Like, I think you actually have to do something for a long time before you know what it is that you're doing. Um, and so beeswax was sort of my way to figuring that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I, I think that, I think you're right. I think people can be too attached to the outcome. Um, I know I certainly, that's something that I struggle with when I sit down to do anything creative, I'm very attached to the outcome <laughs> yeah. and, and potentially why I haven't taken any art further is because right. I'm quite impatient and I, I, I get easily, not easily disappointed. I wouldn't say that, but you know, you want it to be good. Like I want things to yeah. be good. I'm not, I'm not patient enough to do the work. <laughs> Yeah, and I want things to be good too. I mean, I, I'm the same way, but you need a lot of time of just putting things in before you have enough information basically about what it is that you're doing. And then at some point, I think in the ideal scenario, things start to create, like things start to fold in on each other and create like a positive feedback so that you have enough information. So you have, from that, you have even more information about what it is you're doing, what it is, you're trying to express um, 
how how you express yourself, uh, your skill, you know, you mean your skills, everything sort of starts to become clearer. But it, I think that takes a lot of time. Yeah. And that's really why I like thinking about art as a as a practice um, more than anything. Um, that like, if you could just sort of like quiet all of the noises in your head and just do, just do the thing, just practice, just practice making stuff and don't yeah. worry about anything else. And if you do that for enough years, um, things will, things will start to become clear. But yeah, again, I mean, I think about it all the time. Like the idea that, that you're supposed to have some clarity before you start, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's so true. I've got it all backwards. <laughs> I mean, I, I struggle with this every day, right? Like, so I do too. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'd love to show people some of your encaustic work that we've got um, loaded up here in the background. And I was surprised when you said, I'll show people your studio as well. But when the thing about the internet and seeing things digitally is you sometimes don't get that idea of perspective and actually how big pieces are yeah. and I was surprised when I saw your piece on your table exactly like it looked big but I was expecting your pieces to kind of be like uh, in my mind I had this preconceived yeah. conception that they were small encaustic pieces oh. yeah but yeah this, this one here, this is beautiful <laughs> that's um this is this this whole series um, was really a turning point for me. Again, so I mean, it's encaustic, so it's beeswax and resin and oil, um, and there's photography. Um, but this was this was a turning point for me because it's where um, I really started to incorporate thread uh, work into my encaustic painting. So there's thread that's embedded in there. Um, and I had for years been working um, on encaustic and on thread work as two separate endeavors. And again, this is part of what I'm saying. I mean, I, I was in love with both practices um, and then it just took enough time of doing both separately and feeling a little bit like a crazy person uh, that didn't know what I was doing um, before I realized that, that they could come together into, into um, one expression. Um, and, and now most of my work incorporates beeswax and thread. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, this is a big, this is a big painting. I mean, this, I, I, they get as big as five feet. I don't think I've gone bigger than five feet. Yeah. And how did you, so on this, this, this work here, are you taking photos and then embedding the photos or doing an image transfer? How, what's your process with that? Yeah, those are not image transfers. I, I love image transfers. I've seen some beautiful work. I haven't done any really um, great ones. Um, I'd like to circle back to it and keep trying at some point. But these are these are photographs that are printed on ar archival paper um, that are embedded in the wax. Um, oh, wow. and fused in with lots of layers and some paint on top. So they're like half painted, but they're, they're, there are photographs in there. Yeah, because I was going to say the clarity of them um, is really beautiful, especially this one. Like it, 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 it feels photographic um, in the way that it's, it's, it looks realistic, but not realistic. Does that make sense? Like I'm not saying it looks like a photograph, but, you know, if you were standing back, it, it could be until you get up closer. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There's other stuff in there. I think there's some wire in there, actually. Not in that oh. one. There's that in that one, one has some wire. Um, in in the other one, there's paper incorporated. Um, oh. That That's one is thread and photography and oil and beeswax, of course. Yeah, yeah. And these these blue pieces are really gorgeous as well. Those are. Um, those are a little smaller. Those are, um, I don't know, they're not quite as large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this one here. My, my mother-in-law, Noni, who's watching, she's um, an encaustic artist as well. She does some beautiful work too, so I'm sure she's, she's having a little drool in the background. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun to see um, what other encaustic artists do, and that's one of the things that I love about the medium is that because it's sort of been 
rediscovered or it's being rediscovered, there's not like a lot of historical knowledge about how it's done. There isn't a sense of how it ought to be done. And I find that they're just artists all over the world who are just figuring out for themselves um, what works for them. And so it's really exciting to see how different people use the medium. Yeah, yeah. We've got a few questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so Janet says, can you describe uh, the process of combining the thread work with wax? And yeah. So um, it's different with different substrates. So on the wood panels, um, it's actually a bit of an illusion. Um, I obviously can't sew through the wood panel. And so I'm really essentially just stretching the thread over the area and then embedding it in both ends. And so, and I really embed it. I've learned that the thread can come loose over time. So now I really um, put a lot of wax on both ends over the top and fuse it and do that a few times. So there, it's taut enough to create the illusion of sewing through, but it's not sewn through. Um, more recently in the last year, I've been working a lot on paper um, and it's really satisfying to actually sew through the paper. So when, when it's still warm and fresh, um, I can sew right through the paper, the, the paper that's coated with beeswax um, and pull it through. And so I'm doing a lot of embroidering through uh, beeswax laden paper now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Noni asked the same question. So, yeah, when you say use thread, do you stitch or lay in? So that that was everybody was on the same wavelength there. Yeah. Thanks, Noni. Um, maybe another idea, I don't know whether you've done it before, is if you're embedding paper into your encaustic work, you could stitch through the paper and then embed it and see what happens. But then you'd be painting, I guess, over the thread. Yeah, it's hard to control the surface that way. I mean, yeah. um you you get yeah yes absolutely I yeah. don't do as much but um, yeah. then you get like a chunkier surface I find yeah there's That's something one of the about, there's something about building up the um you know, the, the natural texture that's created and then pulling it back and having some control over what that surface is that I also really like. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a delicate balance between going with that natural texture that you get from working with encaustic and also feeling like you're not just at the mercy of, of what happens, but that you're, you know, you have some intentionality with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, Noni and I, uh, when we sort of first, dis we first discovered encaustics by, I don't know actually how it happened, Noni, you might remember, but I was just doing a Google and I was like, oh, there's a weekend course in encaustics, let's do it. And I invited Noni to come along and, and yeah. my, our friend Jen and we came along and we did, we, we had a great little weekend. It was really good. You know, we learned how to embed the image transfers and do all the like, you know, but then Noni just took it to another level and she continued on and, and had an exhibition and just beautiful, beautiful Amazing. work. Well, you yeah. guys did the beehive also, right? Yeah. So that's where my love of, I, I came to it in the sense that I fell in love with encaustics and then I was like, whoa, bees. <laughs> yeah. And then, and now we've just started in our beekeeping journey. So that started in December last year. Yeah. Uh, the hive was ordered 12 months prior and built and um, it took a little while to be made because I wanted something really beautiful and I wanted something that was really healthy for the bees as well and uh yeah so now we have I'm assuming that we're going to get out a bit of wax out of it and it'll be interesting I might have to give it to Noni and she can process it do you process your own wax I don't it's really um it's really hard to get it filtered right um so yeah. I buy it from a local beekeeper who also makes it um for for you know who also renders the, the wax for artists yeah, I, I mean, I use it. I use um, I use some of the wax from from our hive for um, for specific things, but for for the paintings, I don't. It really has to be very finely filtered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can certainly um, appreciate that now, having worked in encaustic and working with that beautiful, silky, gorgeous wax, yeah. and then getting wax out of. We did yeah. a cutout out of a roof and we ended up with a big bucket of wax. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, there's like legs and wings and stuff in there and chunks of, you know, semi-digested pollen cakes. And it, there's just, yeah, it's not, it's not very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> what was the,
the impetus for you to go, you know what, I'm going to put my artwork inside a beehive? What? Where did that idea come from? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, I guess um, this is a good example of what I was, where I started um, by talking about how, like, at some point, if you do something for long enough, this feedback loop starts to happen. Um, uh, where I mean it was just really incremental like first I was just working with uh encaustic in a more traditional kind of way and then of course when you're immersed in a medium you want to learn about it so I started learning about bees and I had a certain late sort of a like a latent interest in bees from before that but I had never really pursued the interest and learned about them and then the more I learned about bees the more that informed my work and then I started using um I think little bits of comb and then I made a relationship with a beekeeper and then like it was very incremental and then at some point I was like wait a minute why am I doing all of this work taking everything out why don't we flip it around and I can put some stuff in um, and I mean I guess also I should mention that that this whole project is completely not even remotely possible without the help of the beekeeper that I work with um, named Miley Norden. She's an amazing beekeeper in Ontario. Um, and she's been totally indispensable to the project. I mean, she's she's taught me everything I know about beekeeping, which is very little, by the way. Um, I'm also very new, a very novice beekeeper. Um, and I'm under her guidance entirely with that. But also she's been really indispensable in helping to um, think about what the possibilities are um, and, and for me, it's really important to work on a really small scale. Like I'm, I'm interested in the health and the well-being of the, of the bees. Um, and I'm interested also in working like with this project, I really do think about it as a collaboration. And so I haven't wanted to have this top down approach of like almost directing the bees of what it is that we're going to make. Um, I wanted to go really slowly and just sort of, um, experiment with what the possibilities are on a very small scale by just putting something in, seeing what the response is, taking it out, thinking about what if we did this a little bit differently and then developing something together based on what it is that they're doing. Um, and, I, and Miley is really, um, like just everything about her is, uh, works with that kind of an approach it's not like a big like pie in the sky kind of a thing it's a really um like it's a conversation with the bees more than anything yeah for sure i'm going to pop up some photos of your beautiful work so people can see what what you've been doing here so basically this is a standard frame, yeah? So this is a standard yeah. frame that would go into a Langstroth hive. That's right. And so you've got here an embroidery, do you call it an embroidery hoop, yeah? Yes, they're in embroidery hoops. Yeah. And so you create the artwork within these hoops and then you attach it somehow onto the frame. Yeah. And then you place an empty frame. So for people that, I mean, it's pretty standard, but so this area where we're seeing the honeycomb and the bees would all be empty and you place it into the hive and let the bees do their work that's right yeah yeah i mean it's a really simple concept um yeah uh and i really liked the use of the embroidery hoop like at first it was sort of um it just sort of happened by happenstance in the sense that I had been working with embroideries in hoops and I needed something to create like a barrier or a frame inside of the Langstroth high frame. Um, but I also really like it because, um, you know, most of the bees in a hive are female and there is this like, there is this reference um, here to uh, women's work, to traditional women's thread work. Um, and that's one of the themes that I really like to explore. So keeping, keeping that embroidery hoop um, intact was part of, um, of the early iterations of this project. This season for the first time, I've, I've actually gone outside of the embroidery hoop. Um, you don't have images of those yet. Those are just coming out of the hives now. 
Um, so I haven't posted any of those. But again, just it's just an example of a very small kind of step in exploring what the next possibility is. Is like, what if we take away the frame, the embroidery hoop? How can we do that? Um, so that's where I am now with it. Yeah. Whereabouts do you place them in the hive? Like, I mean, a hive is, um, you know, you've got your, I call it the nucleus, but, you know, you've got your brood, which is like this circle in the middle, and that's where the queen bee usually is hanging around there laying her eggs. And then, you know, you have your, your other cells and then you have yeah. your honey and, and it goes out. Did it take you a long time to figure out where in the hive is the best placement? Yeah, and this is, again, I mean, uh, I mean, it would be misleading to say that I figured that out. It's really Miley who is the brains behind that that side of the operation. Um, but I think that, um, I mean, first of all, we definitely use uh, it uh, with the queen excluder on the, on the bottom so that there is no brood um, in the top where my, I put my art. Um, and um, it, it tends to do a little bit better towards the middle but um, as long as there's, as long as there's, there isn't the queen laying eggs in the art, it seems yes. to work okay. Yeah. 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 And how here, much honey do you get? Seasonal, like the, the, the bee season is so relatively short here. Um, yeah. Like you guys, I know you have, you have your bees active all year and my sister-in-law's in Southern California, she has bees all year, but it's very short here. Um, yeah. And so I know this is, um, I was talking to you about this the other day and but um like at some level that's frustrating that i can only work on this project for a few months mm -hmm. of the year but on on another level it's actually been really nice like because enough years have gone past that there's this really kind of seasonal aspect to my work that um uh it's not by design it's not that i wanted to work seasonally but i have to because i'm plugged into their schedule and uh it's it's actually been been really nice yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And it takes a lot. I mean, creating wax for bees is is quite an intensive process for them. Um, it's it's like building their house, really. So it's going to take time yeah. and you'd have to do it in the right way and for the welfare of the bees and the, and the colony as a whole. And um, it takes a lot of protein, doesn't it? They need a lot of protein and nectar to be able to build their yeah. wax. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it makes your work even more special, I feel. Um, and, yeah, you learn to really appreciate nature and, and bees. Yeah, and just to be plugged into what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it also makes me more aware of what's happening locally with the, with the season. So it's been great. It's been a really eye-opening experience for me. Yeah. And you sell these works? I do, yeah. Yeah. And how did, how did, I, I hope you don't mind, but I put a couple of images up on our local beekeeping group um, yeah. here in Australia. And I was like, oh, look at this, guys. Like, what do you think? And, and they're like, wow, wow, wow. And some of the questions that came up were if it's being, if the work's being sold, like, how do you preserve the work? Because yeah. beekeepers would know that when you, leave wax out other bees will come and take the wax they'll rob the wax yeah, they'll rob the wax yeah <laughs> so and then i just had these images of your beautiful work hanging in someone's house and like bees would be smelling it and coming in and attracting it yeah have you ever had that I mean, it's kind of part of buying a natural product really right yeah. and so i mean they're meant to be inside um and the wax yeah. itself will stay forever um it's easily crushed though i mean it is an organic product so yeah, there's that aspect to it for sure. Yeah, so the work yeah. comes with a little disclaimer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. In, in encaustic work, you you mix the wax with some Dharma resin to uh, make it harder and to also increase its uh, melting point. Yes. Um, do you know what the melting point is? Like is there much, is there any risk of the work melting in someone's home or...? Like just um, are you talking about the um the the encaustic paintings? No, like the encaustic paintings are treated well, you've got the the resin in there which increases the the yeah. melting. So there's I think it's two hundred degrees or something, isn't it? It's yeah. like very a lot higher. Yeah, that's right. A lot. 
but just natural beeswax that's within the, the frame and around the work. Like if, if it was placed, say, for instance, near a window and it got direct sunlight, there, I would imagine that it would melt. I mean, I think I don't actually, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure what the melting point is for, for yeah. beeswax. I mean, I don't think it would melt if it was in the direct sunlight, um, unless it was very, very hot, but it, it would definitely soften. Um, yeah. So yeah, I definitely recommend not putting it in direct sunlight. Um, the melting yeah. point, I'm not sure, maybe one of the, the, the viewers knows, that's something that I should know, but don't know. No, I don't know either. I don't yeah. know either. I just thought, oh, it's just, um, I don't know. I tend to go into logistics. I go, oh, that's beautiful. And then I try and figure out how, how does it happen and how does it work? And then I'm like, oh, what are the implications of how that works? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the nice thing about about the beeswax is that it does, it does sort of stay, like it's not going to deteriorate on its own. Like obviously the sun is going gonna, is gonna to melt it when it gets hot enough. Um, I think more than anything, it's it would be susceptible to being crushed. Like it can very easily yeah. be crushed if you lean against it. Um, yeah. So I know some people who have bought the pieces um, have talked about putting them in frames or some kind of protection around them. Oh, good idea. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think you, for you, me, I, in my house, I would be more concerned about that than just outright melting. Like just with kids and life being what it is, you could easily, you know, um, really lean against it and then it would get crushed. I mean, I've also, the other thing is that you can also repair it really easily, right? Because you just can take it out and put it back in the hive for, for a day or two and, and they'll repair oh, yeah. the repair the gun, so. That's yeah. the beautiful thing about bees, isn't it? They'll just fix yeah. it up. They'll fix people's mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, incredible. Um, Daniel did a bit of research in the background and he said he's discovered oh. that 62 to 64 degrees. Right. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, you know, that's, um, yeah. 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 Oh, it's interesting, isn't it? Just, um, yeah. Yeah, don't don't put them in the Australian hot sun. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, Australia, that's a whole other thing than Toronto. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, have you had any issues shipping your work? Do you, do you ship your beeswax work internationally? I do. Is there any yeah. biosecurity that you have to think of? No, I haven't had trouble so far. So far, so good. I just put, you know, down that it's an acoustic work and I don't get into, you know, I don't nobody's asked any questions it's been okay so far yeah, yeah. good on you um that's good to know but I'll, I'll i'd love to put in up a few more images of your work this one here is um this is obviously what it looks like before it goes into the hive correct uh yeah that's right mm -hmm. yeah I mean, I only hesitate because not all of them go into the hive. Like I make some pieces like this that incorporate comb and that are made out of encaustic and other materials. And I just keep them as embroideries, um, like what I'm calling encaustic embroideries. Um, but this one did end up going into a hive, I believe. Yeah, it's just beautiful. I think that that combination of the subtle blues with the birch, it's just a beautiful combination. Um, birch bark is something it's a material that I really enjoy working with I find that I can do a lot it has a lot of flexibility it's just it's easy to forage here um, it's easy to embed in wax um, uh, and it's easy to sew through and I find it really beautiful so um, I've done a lot of work with with uh, birch bark and on my website actually this piece here has some birch bark incorporated in it also on my website, I have some big panels. I did some, you know, five feet by five feet panels made out of um, uh, birch bark, exclusively out of birch bark and encaustic and um, and resin. And mm. that was a really fun series. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'll have to go back and have a look at them. That's gorgeous. It, so it sounds beautiful, just the whole mixture of the birch bark and the wax and... Um, for, pe for anybody that hasn't worked in encaustic or hasn't opened up a beehive, the smell is just beautiful. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. 
and it stays that way over years. I mean, the the encaustic paintings that I have from years ago, you can still, you can go right up to them and you can touch them and smell them. And it's a really sort of like multi-sensory experience. Yeah. Yeah. Or well, people, um, yeah, don't, yeah, don't hang over a fireplace either. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Oh, Gary, you know, Gary from the yeah, great work. Yeah, it is beautiful work. Um, Gary's a, a filmmaker in the UK that we've recently worked with. So nice to see you, Gary. Um, do the wax works get checked for varroa mite prior to shipping? Yeah, yeah that's, they that's do. It. Yeah, they do. Absolutely. That's really important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a big topic, isn't it? The the varroa mite. We don't. I don't believe we have it in Australia. You um, don't. No, I don't believe we do. I know there's. Yeah, we have a lot of biosecurity around it. Um, do you have anything sure. that's equivalent? Any kind of uh, of mite or insects that are compromised have, in the hives? There. Yeah, we have hive beetle, and we have the moth as well. Oh. So the wax moth. Wax moth, um, yeah. Yeah, wax moth. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of other um, uh, bugs and stuff. I'm not very up on that. I try and I, I don't treat for any of it, so I don't yeah. use chemicals in our hive, anything yeah. like that. I've just got the best hive that we could afford and then um, just keep a close eye on them and then if they get, you know, eaten out by wax moth, well, then it wasn't a strong hive. I feel like if you've got a strong colony, they can usually deal with what they need to deal with without intervention. Yeah. Um, but if it's a weakening colony for whatever reason, you know, there's not enough forage around or they might, you know, then they'll they'll naturally, they'll, they'll die. They, yeah. You know, that's just, just what happens. But so I try and keep things as natural and possible and, and give them the environment that, um, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. So Sharon, thanks, Sharon. She says, we don't have varroa mite yet. We also have American brood. Okay, yeah, cool. I haven't come across that one either. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, Sandy's asked, how do you get the honey out from around the artwork? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's um, mostly it's a question of getting it out quickly. Like I try to get it out um, in and out of the hive quickly. And so, again, it's a very limited season here. And so it's about timing it so that we're putting the pieces in at the height of a pollen glut and then getting them out as quickly as possible. Um, so I haven't had any pieces that have been really very seriously laden with honey, but I have had, you know, a little bit of honey in um, or nectar in that. And then you just leave, I've just left them out for a few hours in front and the bees will rob up the honey. Yeah. Yeah. And that they're such good. They, they clean up after themselves. They, do, they really clean it all up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're incredible. Um, yeah, an incredible species, incredible insects. They're just yeah. the, the more you learn. About, I mean, I don't think I'll ever know as much as what I should about them, but I just enjoy watching them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're and really they're just, beautiful to watch. Oh, yeah, beautiful. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but sometimes I'll, I'll never forget. And I can't really take credit for the idea. It was one of my friends, Joe, who has. Um, has beehives and she's a beautiful artist she's an art teacher and she said to me and I just love sitting in front of my hive with a cup of tea and she you know when you squint your eyes and you make everything defocused yeah and she says what she does and I've done it and it's really beautiful to do is she just sits in front of the hive and she watches the patterns they make as they're entering the hive and and if you squint your eyes you're not focusing just on the one bee you can focus on the whole yeah. And you watch this pattern as they, they come in to the hive and it's it's incredible. Yeah. And they, they do it and, and it's almost like they follow this same pattern and it's like almost like it looks almost like a figure eight. It's very organic. It's not like a a beeline. It's not like yeah. a boom. It, yeah. It's very much a <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. It's it's mesmerizing. Yeah, and yeah. They're, they know exactly what they're doing. They're not, like, meandering around. And even when they forage, there's no guesswork involved in it at all. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. 
Well, what you're doing is is really lovely and um, I hope that it, yeah, I hope that it continues really well this season. I look forward to seeing what else you you pull out of the hive. and well, what Me you too. There's always yeah. that guesswork. I mean, I really don't know what it's going to be entirely, so that's fun to see. Yeah. And I mean, I guess the, tone, the honeycomb varies. It varies in colour, it varies in texture, and so, um, yeah, it's always it's always a surprise. Yeah, yeah, that's gorgeous. And, yeah, you just never know what you're going to get, are you? Are you? Yeah. You never know what you're going to get with the, with the, when you pull it out. So yeah. you're letting go of that outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of, there have been a lot of failed attempts also, which is, which is part of the process of learning, you know, what works and what doesn't. So, yeah. 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 Francie, sorry, Francie, I missed your question. Um, do insects attack the encaustic? Um, I've never had that. No. No. Yeah. I wonder why. Um, <laughs> I wonder why. Maybe um, maybe the resin or something has. That's something what I would think. It. Yeah, I would think that the that there's enough res resin in there to protect the wax. Yeah, yeah. I've certainly haven't had any. Um, yeah, you know, like I had these images of all the bees coming in and <laughs> stealing all the wax and things like that, but yeah. no, it's never happened. No, it's yeah. never happened. But um, I do think that the resin is probably a big part of that. And I, I'm not, I don't think that that's been a problem historically with encaustic, uh, encaustic work. Yeah, yeah. So, Chris, where can we follow Ava's sweet work? That's, that's a lovely comment. I had a, had a chuckle. So we've just popped a link up to Ava's website. Sorry, Ava, I keep going back to Ava. It's not it's Ava. Fine. I didn't even notice. It's fine. Sorry. <laughs> it's just habit. Um, so Ava's website's there and also Instagram. And do you do Facebook as well? I don't. I do have a Facebook account. I haven't been active on it, but I'm on it. I, I, I'm on it sometimes from time to time, but most of my work is not there. Most of my work is on Instagram and on my website. Yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous, perfect. Well, we've popped links up there so everybody can keep, keep an eye on you. Thanks. So what's in the pipeline now? Like what are you working on at the moment? Um, I'm working on paper now. I've really been enjoying working on paper and um, it feels totally different. It feels like a new direction, but also like the same as what I've been doing somehow, just like a new phase. Um, it's a lot more delicate and I'm really enjoying that delicacy mixed with the beeswax. It's a beautiful combination. And, and as I was saying before, I love that I, love that I can sew through it. Um, after spending, you know, several years really just um, embedding the thread, I'm just pulling it through the thread now. It's very satisfying. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's uh, that's what the next few months looks like for me. Yeah, I can certainly testify to that as well. That um, I remember the first time I stitched through paper, and that was really fun because I like things that are easy. Hello, this is your studio assistant. This is my this is my dog panda. Yeah, oh, that's not a dog. That's a horse. I know she's a great Dane. She's very sweet. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's huge. Yeah. Oh, I wish we could see all of her. Can we see all of her? Um, really. yeah. Come on, come say hi. No, she's not. Too shy. She's too shy. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what I was saying now. <laughs> um, yeah, what were you saying? I lost it also. I know. I've lost my train of thought as well. About to drive a school bus. That's cool. That's right. So stitching into paper because I like things easy. Oh, yeah. And But then I've done a little bit of encaustic work where I've um, – use plaster and dipped the paper into the wax and then once you start stitching through the paper that's been like laden with wax that's a whole nother experience like yeah, yeah, yeah highly yeah. recommended sorry what did you say <laughs> highly recommended yeah it's it's an, it's incredible what it does i mean first of all just the feel of it um and it looks so beautiful and it gives a lot of durability to the paper a lot of structure to the paper so there are endless possibilities yeah and I'm going to show um, a few of your beautiful paperworks here. So this would be, are these real ginkgo leaves? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Also just, 
you know, embedded in wax, soaked in beeswax and pressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then and there's then beeswax, there is beeswax on the paper as well. Gorgeous. Yeah. And the colors are stunning. Um, and porcupine quills, they're such a popular material to work with, aren't they? Um, if they're new for me, like I maybe discovered them, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago. Um, and uh, I can't get enough of them. They're just amazing. Again, the possibilities are endless with them. And um, I love the way that they sit on the beeswax. And uh, I've had a lot of fun with them. And I'm not nearly done with them. I'm I'm still going strong. Yeah. Yeah. That, and I love the contrast of the black against the, the creamy white background. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Really striking. And is this horse hair? You mentioned that you use horse hair. Yeah, it is horse hair. Um, another really fun material to use. And um, uh, it's really finicky. It's really, I mean, the, each piece is so fine. Um, that it can get really tedious to work with, but it, it's beautiful. Um, and I'd like to do more with horsehair. I'd like to do some weaving with horsehair. Um, it, it also embeds in beeswax really well. Um, so some house sewing with the beeswax has been something that I've started to do, but it's it's definitely um, something that I that I hope to do more of in the coming year. Yeah, yeah. And talking about weaving, it was sort of you know it was like six degrees of separation like I discovered your work through an Instagram post that textile curator um put up oh, they, yeah. were doing, they were doing a hundred days of um artists yeah. and and um I I came, I saw your beautiful beeswax collaborate uh yeah honeycomb collaboration and I was like wow this is beautiful never seen anything like it before it was like very striking and made a comment and said thank you for them for, for posting it and then um and then I think I reached out to you or you reached out to me and it was like and then I was at the, that time was working with Harriet Goodall creating her weaving course and I didn't realize that you were a fan of Harriet's and then she'd also discovered you about the same time as that post came out she's like oh yeah I know Ava's work yeah that's the beeswax lady <laughs> Amazing. yeah I was a huge fan of Harriet's work and um and I'm taking her core her online course yeah. now which is amazing uh, which you helped develop. And uh, it's, and so that's, I mean, that's another thing that's really fun to start incorporating. I mean, I haven't, I don't have the skills yet to start doing that, but I have been thinking about trying to work more dimensionally. And already I can see that some of the ways that um, Harriet has of thinking about the materials are helping me to just grow out of two dimensions now. And that's, I mean, the possibilities for that seem endless. Yeah, and some of the work you're creating and you're posting into the group and, and Harriet's like, she's like, wow, like this is great. Um, it's really fun. It's yeah. fun to, to learn a new skill and to just sort of like have some time to figure out how to, uh, yeah, how to incorporate it into, into what my project is. And so, I mean, I don't know what that is yet and I'm just at the beginning of the course, um, but I think there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room to go there still. Yeah. Would you mind yeah. if I showed a couple of your looping pieces so people no, no, can see no, no. how you're taking it to the next level? Yeah. So you've got um, your caustic paper here and then you've so you've started to do, uh, it's wax linen. Are you using wax linen? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of beeswax on top of it as well. Just like I literally just um, dipped the whole thing in beeswax because I wanted it to have a lot of strength. Yeah. 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 And then so that's sort of like have like, you know, you're looping um, and creating sort of trying to create that space. But then you, you've, you've taken it again further and started um, looping over objects like this. Is it, what is that? Is that a bone or a piece of driftwood? It looks like a piece of bone, which I love, but it's driftwood, actually. Yeah. And it could almost be a shell as well, couldn't it? Yeah, it does look like a shell. You're right. I never noticed that. But that from that angle, it certainly does. Yeah. 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 But it's just just stunning what you're doing there. And I can't wait to see where else you, you, you take take your work. It's it's mind blowing. But I'd also love to mention, um, oh look, here's another piece here. I've just seen. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> That's um 
Yeah, that's, again, just thinking about how to get a little bit of more dimension to the, you know, using the same, these are just like sort of test pieces, but they're just, um, you know, early steps in trying to incorporate some of the things that Harriet's teaching um, into what it is that I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, that angle's gorgeous as well. Yeah. And you're also a jeweler or you've, you've, I mean, I'm not a jeweler, but I'm interested in beeswax. And so that was one of the things that I've spent some time doing is, um, is carving rings and having them cast from beeswax, um, which is like, I gather it's a very ancient way of making jewelry. Um, um, I don't have a ton of experience doing it, but I do have a collection of maybe 20 or 30 rings and I'd like to make more. It's really satisfying. And one of the things that I like about it is that it's very portable. I mean, it's hard for me. Um, we have a place up up north, um, a few hours north of Toronto, kind of in a in a remote part of the province or relatively remote part of the province. Um, and I have to leave my studio to spend time there. Um, and so this is a great thing to do that I can just take with me a little hunk of the wax and and sit outside and and make these. So I like to do that in the summertime. So you have, can you explain that process for me? Because I'm trying to get my head around it. So you have a chunk of wax and then you carve the shape of the ring into the wax. That's right. And then you pour gold into it? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I actually take it to um, a caster who creates a mold out of it um, and then injects the mold with metal, so silver or whatever the metal is. Um, and uh, and then one of the nice things about it is that you get to actually keep the mold so you can make multiples of the same thing, which is never like, I'm sure that there are artists watching this, like who know that it's always like a one off, you know, as you could spend, you can spend a lot of hours, you can spend a hundred hours making a piece of work. And then it, that's, that's all, that's, it's one thing. You can never get it back. Um, but this is the only thing I've ever made where there are multiples possible, so. That's kind of nice. I have a stack of the molds now that I can keep and and just make more at a time, which is a bit of a, it's a novelty for me. Yeah, yeah, that's gorgeous. Yep. What a wonderful way. Um, Janet asked, what what size are the pieces and also pieces with minerals, quartz, et cetera? So the works on paper, how, how big are those? The works on, those recent works on paper with the minerals, those are small. Those are nine and a half by 11 and a half inches yeah yeah inches sorry yeah 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 no no that's okay i'm just thinking yeah so nine and a half by eleven and a half okay yep yeah so quite, yeah yeah so maybe that's like about an a4 just over an a4 size like a standard photocopy paper a little bit bigger than a standard photocopy uh, paper. a little bit bigger than that yeah yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Daniel, he's a sweetheart. 23 centimetres for, for my brain. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the paper that, I, that I've that i really fallen in love with is Japanese, this particular Japanese paper, um, and I'm limited in the sizes that I can get, and so, and I have a big stack of it, and so I, and I'm, I'm working through the whole stack, so they're all the same. Those are all the same size. Yeah, beautiful. Are they like a watercolor type paper to, to really absorb the wax or? Yeah, they're a little bit thick. And so they really take the wax well. And again, I can sew through them and um, they take the thread and they take the toughness of pulling through it. Um, it's just a really, it's, it's a great combination of a, a paper that's very hardy and very delicate at the same time. Yeah, beautiful. Well, Noni certainly loves the horsehair piece. Yeah, I thought that was incredible as well. Yeah, really beautiful, um, soft and delicate. Ava, have you ever thought about teaching? Have you ever have you had people approach you to to teach workshops yet? Because I'm sure you will. Uh, I haven't done any teaching in this area. I've done teaching in the past for other things, not for encaustic work. Um, uh, and I would be open to doing it. I think the biggest obstacle for me is just time. I, you know, yeah. just time. Um, I have kids and I have my art practice. And so, um, yeah. yeah, so it's always a struggle. So it's not something that I've pursued. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. I just thought with all your knowledge now that you've accumulated over the years and your beautiful work that it almost, it doesn't even feel like a natural progression, but yeah, a lot of artists, end up teaching you know yeah 
No, I know that's the case. And it's something that, um, that I think I would probably enjoy, but I haven't done. Yeah. There's yeah. time. There's time for that. Yeah. Before we before we go, we're going to have to have a little bit of studio envy, people, because um, Ava's studio is just amazing. <laughs> it's my garage. I mean, it's really just a converted garage. And um, I snapped those pictures this morning, Ange, and it's a bit of a mess. But, um, I love it. But it, it has everything packed in there. There's a, there are, I have a lot of materials on hand. And in fact, you know, I've recently decided to basically stop buying materials um, and just to just use what I can find, either stuff that I already have in my studio or stuff that I forage. Um, because, you know, you can just keep adding and adding. But there's, there's uh, I have piles of stuff that I've collected over the years. Yeah. Well, this does not look like a mess in my standards at all. It looks like it's just beautifully curated. And, you know, you've got your beehives, you've got your encaustic paintings, which, you know, to see them in a place like, you know, it just it just adds context as well for me when you see a piece of work, um, not just as like a flat image, like, so for instance, you know, we might be looking at, um, say, this one here, mm -hmm which is beautiful and then when you see it here I go oh yeah I can imagine that on my wall you know what I mean because you're seeing it like kind of in situ yeah like as it would would be so I just think yeah it's I really enjoy the studio shots and the light the, almost like the lifestyle images I guess you'd call it um, yeah I mean they're they're they come alive I guess yeah that's the nice way of saying it yeah oh and look at your wall there with all your um encaustic colors gorgeous yeah, and yeah. I never use any of them. <laughs> I tend to have the same palette. I mean, I shouldn't <laughs> say never, but um, yeah, but but very rarely do I use all of those beautiful colors. I tend to stick with like the more natural and and um, or you know uh, earthy tones. Um, but over the years, I've accumulated some some, uh, some beautiful colors. Yeah, and then the dry messy the messy dry desk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just pile things on there. I mean, that was supposed to be a place where I could sit and take notes and stuff. And yeah, it's more yeah. of a repository for things. Yeah. And then your horse hair there, I see that it's hanging up. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I've got to ask, how do you harvest the horse hair? <laughs> I buy it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I buy it from a seller on Etsy. Yeah. Okay. And I do you know, it's funny because my mother's a horse rider, and so she's always a little bit like, Why don't you just ask me and I'll bring you horse hair? But this is all it's already cleaned and washed and it's sold in bundles, and so it's very easy for me to use. So that's my go to source. Sometimes it's easier just to pay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they're all, when they come, they're all lined up perfectly. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> Although I must admit, you know, we do, have, we've got an equestrian centre next door to us. And um, one day we woke up, funny story, unrelated, but we woke up and the horse had came around the back and we don't really have a back fence and they left their gates open. And yeah. we woke up to a horse on our back decking. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> And I'll never forget, we had guinea pigs at the time and it was just like a year ago and my son, and it was trying to eat the uh, the hay out of the guinea pigs uh, yeah. cage and literally my son gets up before the crack of dawn and he comes screaming up the stairs going, Mum, there's a horse that's trying to eat the guinea pigs. And I'm like, a horse is trying to eat the guinea pigs? Like, what is this kid going on about? Sure enough come running downstairs and there's literally a horse staring in the kitchen window um that's amazing certainly next time that happens i'll, I'll be sure to take a snip of the tail <laughs> yeah awesome. it would be very 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 tempting to do that so uh yeah it is it's really beautiful yeah the natural light is important in a studio isn't it um, yeah, although it can be tricky, you know, like there's something also nice about, I know this is sort of, a, I'm not supposed to feel this way, but there's something about artificial light that's nice in a studio because you can really control it. Um, so that's one thing that I think that there's, there are pros and cons to both. I mean, also depending on where you live, but here certainly there are a lot of very dark months. So 
um, some good um, non-natural light is essential. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, yeah, and the exhaust hood. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's just, great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of people think that encaustic is caustic, and it can be if you overheat it, can't it? It can right. be quite caustic, yeah. but encaustic in itself, if it's treated right, it's actually very safe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, and the, it is tempting to, to crank up the heat a little bit. I found like when I was first using and working with encaustic, I was very always tempted to crank up the heat because it's much, it, the application is much smoother and the whole thing is much faster. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm very careful with the temperature now when I'm heating, I heat at, at a really low temperature um, and I have a thermometer that I'm constantly checking and there's, there are really no fumes at all, but the hood is essential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alicia um, may have came in late, but she's just asked, do you stitch first and then apply the wax or the other way around? Um, we mentioned it earlier, Alicia, but um, you can maybe cover it again, Ava. Uh, it depends on the piece. I don't know which pieces she's referring to on the on the um, the painting on wood panel. They're not really stitched through. There, there's a I start with the painting and then I lay the thread over and embed the thread in wax. Um, but, uh, some of the pieces on paper, for example, um, uh, I, I'm sewing right through the paper, um, and the wax, I mean, I guess in both cases, the wax is both underneath and on top of the thread, but in some cases, I guess the only thing I'm saying is in, is in some cases, the thread goes right through and in mm -hmm. some cases it's just lying on the surface. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this one is really, that last one that you showed with the leaf is really an embroidery. So I'm sewing right through the beeswax, the paper and the leaf. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this one's more embedded. That one is embedded. That one is not sewn through. It's just sort of like a um, evoking a sewing, but it's not a sewing. Yeah, yeah. Gorgeous. And your other, I have to just show a picture because it's so beautiful. Your other great love in life is sourdough making. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do love sourdough. Um, and that is actually um, something that I have taught um, and that I really do enjoy teaching. Um, it's really a passion of mine. Oh, gorgeous. Have you ever been to Paris and gone to Palan? I have, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know she's, I saw recently that she teaches a master class. Um, yeah. I haven't taken it, but uh, it would be, right. that would be fun to do. Yeah, yeah. Have you got a masterclass? Yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't taken any of them, but I don't know. It came across my feed recently and it was intriguing. Yeah. yeah. I tell you what, I'll, I've got, uh, when you join masterclass, it's like, because, you know, I practice what I preach, right? Online learning. It's amazing. Um, yeah. And masterclass, when you subscribe, I've been a subscriber. This is my second year. They actually give you a free gift to give mm -hmm. to someone, so I'll gift you a masterclass. Oh, amazing, and thank you so much. I'll set that up today for you That's and you must so watch. Nice. Thank you. And, yeah. I mean, that um, is the great thing about about um, sourdough is that like, I mean, I guess it's kind of like encaustic is the same thing. Everybody does it a little bit differently. So I've been I've been making sourdough bread for I don't even know how many years and um, and still, like every bakery, every baker will do it a little bit differently. There's always something new to learn and incorporate in terms of the technique or some little nugget of information. Um, so that's really nice. Thank you. Uh, I know. I just love I know that you'll appreciate it. And I know you'll just love it. And um, yeah, happy to happy to do that for you. Absolutely. And I think one of the things I loved about the, the sourdough connection with the, with the bee collaboration is that sourdough is a living organism as well. Um, yep. and, you know, and, and so are the bees and, and the wax. And I just think that's that beautiful connection that you have with, um, with nature and mother earth. And yeah. it's just been such a pleasure, pleasure talking to you today. And thanks oh for um, letting me ask all my geeky questions about the wax. And <laughs> the bees Thank and thanks for everybody who is listening. Much appreciated. What we love to do at the end is play a slideshow or a little video and then everybody can start making their comments now to say thank you very much for Avid for spending her time with us today, um, all the way from Toronto, which is amazing. And um, 
Uh, but before you go, is there any parting words that you'd like to, to leave for anybody or any insights if someone was maybe struggling to find their own way or, or what, what would be some of your parting words? I mean, I guess my only parting words are where I started, which is that um, I think you have to give yourself permission to not know what you're doing before you figure out what you're doing. Um, it seems sort of obvious, but it wasn't to me. And I spent years um, before, it was years before I really understood that um, I didn't have to know uh, what it was that I was trying to express before I started making something. You, you figure that out um, by doing it for a long time and then it drops in over time. So give yourself patience and yeah. allow yeah. yourself some time. Yeah. 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 Well, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for spending this time with us. And, um, Thanks so much. Yeah, you are actually our last Friday feature artist for the season. I'm going to take uh, three weeks off now. Well, not really three weeks off, but three weeks off the lives. Yeah. Um, just have a little bit of a rest and recuperate. We usually do that over the school holidays and spend some Fridays with the kids. And right. um, so it was a, such a beautiful way to end the season. And I can't wait to see what you pull out of the hive in a few months. And, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been really nice. Thanks. No worries. Stay on the line. I'll say a quick goodbye after the show. Okay. See ya. Thanks, everyone, for watching.